Welcome everyone to our CMNB series of COVID-19. I am Claudia Jansen, the Senior Maternal and Child Health Specialist at CMNB. For those who are not familiar with CMNB, CMNB is an NGO who has helped to dedicate to work with the more poor and marginalized people for over 100 years. We have women and children in low resources settings to access to quality healthcare. During this pandemic, we are committed to promote the most and update and relevant information to our colleagues in the field. Today, we are speaking about COVID-19 and malaria. In some of the countries where CMNB works, we have very high prevalence of this disease. We chose this topic because malaria and COVID have similar symptoms that can be confusing in early stages. We want our clinicians and communities were able to recognize well and differentiate what are the symptoms and when it's needed uh, to access to health services. Now, I would like you to introduce our speaker, Dr. Itahara Sivasubramanyam. Thank you, Doctor, to be here. He has more than 20 years of experience practicing medicine. He has a bachelor degree in medicine and surgery. He was graduated from the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. He also has a master in public health from Jeff Hopkins University and a lot of experience, clinical experience in Africa and in the US. He also has experience of working in projects including malaria, nutrition, and Ebola. And currently, he's doing a clinical fellow in palliative medicine, the Michael Hare Medical Center in New York, and also working in the Calvary Hospital, the Bronx. Doctor, thank you very much to be here. Thank you, Claudia, for that wonderful introduction. It's my honor and privilege to make this presentation today. Uh, um, uh, you all be safe wherever you are. The topic today is COVID-19 and malaria, or COVID-19 or malaria. How to differentiate the two? Today, we're going to start with a pretest and an introduction. I'll then go over the pathophysiology of both COVID-19 and malaria. We'll then discuss the epidemiology of both diseases. We'll try to differentiate the symptoms that are common to both, and that could help us differentiate the two. I will then present a case review and simulation. We'll then have a post-test, and I'll discuss the answers and uh, we'll have question and answers, but I guess this is a webinar. Um, I'll be available for questions uh, offline. Pre-test, question number one. Cough is one of the most common presenting symptoms of pediatric illnesses. Question two, malaria caused by infection with plasmodium species parasites remains a major health burden globally. Question three, malaria is not contagious and you can't catch it from physical contact with someone who has it. Question four, there is no vaccine that has demonstrated it can significantly reduce malaria and life-threatening severe malaria in young African children. Question five, in high burden settings, deaths due to malaria in children over five years could increase by up to 36% compared with if there was no COVID-19 pandemic. Question number six, the final one. Anti-malarial medication can be prescribed to patients with fever without testing. So we'll go over the answers to these questions at the end of the presentation. To begin with, I would like us to draw comparisons with the Ebola epidemic that we experienced about five years ago the lessons we've learned and lessons we can apply to the current COVID-19 pandemic. Ebola was a severely contagious disease. 
Um, it was in West Africa. I'm more familiar with its presence in Sierra Leone. It was quite contagious enough that anyone requiring clinical medical care was excluded or scared to access health and medical care because of the similar quarantine contagion from people with Ebola. Same personal protective equipment as you would see for Ebola is what we are facing now with COVID-19. We have seen from anecdotal evidence how mothers, pregnant women, children have limited access to routine prenatal, antenatal, and also infectious disease such as malaria care and access to healthcare and medical facilities during this current COVID-19 pandemic. I show this slide, it's a busy slide. We'll spend a few minutes going over it. First, uh, if you are familiar with the recent CMMB presentation of COVID-19 and pregnancy, uh, this slide borrows from that and builds on it. Uh, we, if we look back at March 24th, the total cases of COVID-19 worldwide was in the border of 300,000. And there were about 33,000 uh, cases in the United States but where CMMB has active uh, missions in Peru, there was only 363 cases, Kenya, 15 cases, Zambia, three cases, Haiti, two cases, and South Sudan had none. March forward to April 18, the worldwide cases had increased to over 2 million. The United States have, now has more than 700,000 cases. Peru was registering 14,000 cases. Kenya was still having only 262 cases reported. Zambia had 57, Haiti had 44, and South Sudan only four. When we access the data as recently as August the 20th, the worldwide cases have leaped to over 22 million, out of which the United States has about five and a half million cases of COVID-19. Peru now is a little more than half a million, 500,000 cases. Kenya is up to 30,000 cases. Zambia, 10,000 cases. Haiti, very close to 8,000 cases. And South Sudan, close to 2,500 cases. Now, when we look at the depth from COVID-19 worldwide, as of August 20 again, we have worldwide deaths of over 700,000 worldwide. The United States has more than 170,000 deaths from COVID-19. Peru has 26,000 deaths. Kenya has 500 cases of death from COVID-19. Zambia has 269 deaths. Haiti has 196 deaths. South Sudan, 47 deaths. I am not trying to uh, minimize the risk of COVID-19. It is a significant global pandemic with significant morbidity and mortality. However, when we compare this to malaria, which is endemic, um, the data from 2018 and 2019 reveals that the cases of malaria worldwide was 228 million. There was no COVID-19 at that time. And you have access to healthcare facilities, adequate testing and treatment. Despite this, there was more than 400,000 deaths from malaria. Well, let's look at the breakdown. You see a pattern here. Uh, while Peru had only 10 deaths, and 70,000 cases of malaria, and Haiti had 80, 80 deaths and 32,000 cases of malaria. The other three countries with CMMB activities, such as Kenya, Zambia, and South Sudan in Africa, had millions of malaria cases, three and a half million in Kenya, 
with 13,300 deaths. Zambia had another 3 million and a half of malaria cases with 7,600 deaths. And South Sudan had 1,800,000 malaria cases with 6,000 deaths. This was when we did not have the COVID-19 pandemic and the healthcare system was working at its optimal best. Now, what happens when with the COVID-19, the fear of it, the limited access to care, these numbers would change. The deaths are likely to rise. And I shall go into some modeling on what the expected increase in the debt are likely to be. But you in the forefront of healthcare delivery in these various locations, you would be aware of more such cases and the data. So to briefly introduce both, COVID-19 is a global pandemic. You heard so much about it. It spread respiratory wise. You cough, you sneeze, the droplets, the saliva carry the virus, which is a coronavirus named so because in, under the microscope, it uh, looks like the sun, the rays of the sun. Um, the cartoon depicts the coronavirus. So it's a virus infection. Malaria, on the other hand, is an endemic disease that is prevalent and present all the time. It's vector borne, transmitted by the mosquito. It's transmitted to people through the bites of the infected female Anopheles mosquito, which literally carries the parasite from person to person. And the parasite is the plasmodium parasite, so it's a parasitic infection. So pathophysiology, COVID-19, you inhale the droplets via the airways. Commonly, the respiratory tract could be by the nose or the mouth, and the virus gets into the system to the lungs mainly. But then there are different stages of COVID-19. As you're already aware, you have the pre symptomatic stage when you would have no symptom at all. Unfortunately, COVID is one of those diseases. You can spread the infection even if you don't have symptoms yet. Then the second stage of symptoms are respiratory, pulmonary symptoms. And you will have cough, sneeze, or breathing difficulties. The third phase is when the body mounts an immune response to attack this virus that is foreign to the body. The body does a great job, but it overdoes it. The immune response is overwhelming, and in fact, it's much more serious than the infection to begin with. The immune system response created attacks the rest of the body. The brain, there's an entity called COVID brain. You can have strokes and other changes to the brain. It causes blood clotting. You can have clotting all over the body. It damages the heart. You can have heart attacks. It can also damage the kidneys. So it's a multi-system severe immune response. That's the third stage of COVID-19. And most of the time when you have that extent of disease, it does not end well, leads to death. Whereas malaria, when the mosquito bites, it introduces the parasite straight directly into the bloodstream. The red blood cells are good media where the parasite is taken up and it's stored sometimes in the liver and it undergoes different stages of development and it can be spilled back into the blood and for the next mosquito to bite and transmit to someone else. So how is COVID-19 spread? It's community spread. What it means is that it's already here with us. And when someone who's having the virus expresses droplets, anyone that's in close proximity is highly at risk to contact this virus. So individuals are close contacts. There's not a definite defined treatment. 
some of the recent studies have shown that antiviral remdesivir can shorten the time to improve a lot of symptoms by a couple of days. Steroids have shown that those with worse lung diseases have some improvement in mortality, but studies are still ongoing. There is a race to find the right vaccine for this virus, and there's no vaccine at present. Malaria too, there is community spread. Areas of the world where malaria is endemic, there's malaria parasite and individuals are walking and talking. All it takes is for a mosquito bite to transmit from someone who has it to someone who does it. However, it's very treatable. In fact, you can cure someone with malaria. The key is to detect it early. In children, as they do not have the immunity to malaria, the malaria infection can be quite severe. COVID-19, scary as it may be, the mortality is less than 5%. What does that mean? Out of every 20 persons that are diagnosed with COVID-19, only less than one would die. However, like I mentioned earlier, it's contagious even before you develop symptoms, if you're infected. So how best to protect ourselves? Mask. Mask help prevent the virus from spreading from those who have the infection to others in the community. And of course, if you socially distance yourself six feet from someone else, less likely for the air droplet to reach you and frequent hand washing. You touch other things and you're likely to introduce the virus to your nose or your mouth. Whereas if you wash your hands, you decrease the virus burden in your hands. Malaria, like we talked about, is treatable, is curable. There's higher mortality in untreated children over five years old. And um, mosquito nets, protective clothing, mosquito repellents. Basically, if we avoid contact with the parasite that is being carried by the mosquito, which is the vector, then there's no way the vector can introduce the malaria parasite into our body. Also, we have chemoprophylaxis. We can take a tablet that can prevent us from having this infection. Many healthcare workers going into endemic areas of malaria are on anti-malaria prophylaxis. Diagnosis and testing. COVID-19 is a new problem. The diagnostic tests are evolving. Initially, we had polymerase chain reaction where you isolate the virus, multiply it many fold. The route of testing for this is nasal. As you can see in the cartoon, you have to literally go back to the back of the nose to get a sample, the nasopharynx. This test takes a longer time, has many procedures involved. There is a cheaper, much faster procedure for testing from the saliva itself. Also, you can pool four or five individual samples together and test it because only less than 10% of the individuals have positive tests, 90% are negative. You can also do a blood test to check for antibodies in those who have had a previous COVID-19 infection, the body fought off the virus, now they have antibodies. So they are immune to it, theoretically. For malaria, you literally take a look at the blood. You take a drop of blood, put it on a slide, look at under the microscope, you see the malaria parasite. Yep, that's confirmation there's malaria parasite. There's also, as you can see in the cartoon, malaria rapid diagnostic test. These detect the evidence of malaria parasites the antigens of the malaria parasite in human blood can be easily administered at home by healthcare workers by taking a drop of blood and adding the reagent. It's, it's comparable to the simple urine uh, pregnancy test. So coming back to the main crux of our presentation, 
when someone has a symptom, is the individual having COVID-19 or is it malaria? Can we tell? How can we screen? Fever is one of the common symptoms of both. So is headache. Both are infections, whether it's a virus infection or parasitic infection, the body mounts a response, an immune reaction. So if this happens, it results in elevated body temperature, there's fever, the sign of infection. When you have a higher fever, the body is uncomfortable, the head aches, you have a headache. When you have fever, the body is hot, you start trying to cool down. The body's natural way of cooling down is to sweat. When you sweat, the water evaporates, produces cooling. You can have body aches, muscle aches, generalized. Fatigue, you're exhausted. You're beat up, no energy to do any activity. Vomiting, sign of the infection. And diarrhea or diarrhea. These symptoms are both common to both COVID-19 and malaria. So when someone has any one of these symptoms, it's very difficult based on the symptom alone to differentiate between the two infections. Let's look at the other set of symptoms. Cough. Like we said, COVID-19 is a respiratory infection. You don't always need to have a cough, but more likely than not, you're bound to have a cough. Malaria, there's no reason why you should develop a cough because the mosquito introduced a parasite in your blood system. Loss of smell. There's something unique about this virus. As it enters the body, it starts not only attaching to receptors in the respiratory tract, but it affects the nerve endings for smell and also for taste. So you commonly have loss of smell, loss of taste. You also have a sore throat. As the virus is working itself down the respiratory tract, you can have cough, loss of smell, loss of taste, sore throat. These are unique and more commonly in COVID and less likely to be in malaria. Now to finish off, malaria, you also have shortness of breath. As the infection worsens and, and goes into the lung, you can have difficulty breathing. This is a much more serious infection requiring a um, uh, higher level of medical care, most likely hospitalization and intensive care. Malaria, on the other hand, also is associated with shake, shaking chill and nausea. In a poster presentation, side by side, just to go over what we have discussed, fever is common to both sweats, headache, muscle aches and pain and fatigue are common to both. As both are infections, they are likely to uh, have a febrile fever reaction, which results in sweating and headache, muscle aches and fatigue. Vomiting, diarrhea, especially cough, sore throat, loss of taste and smell, are more likely to be in COVID-19. And once you have associated difficulty breathing, now you know we're dealing with a much more serious COVID-19 than malaria. Malaria also has shaking chills and nausea. In children, on the other hand, you are unlikely to have specific symptoms. Children are usually irritable, drowsy, they have a poor appetite, they have difficulty sleeping. So malaria can present as these symptoms, but they also can have commonly fever, sweats, headache, body aches, and muscle pain. Like we saw in adults, children with cough, sore throat, loss of taste and smell is unlikely to be COVID-19. Sorry, I, I, it's unlikely to be malaria and more likely to be COVID-19. And just like we talked about in the adults, difficulty breathing signifies a much more serious COVID-19 infection. So let's now have a case review. I recently saw a patient 
who was 66 year old female was traveling from Nairobi, Kenya to Dallas, Texas. While she was in transit in New York City, she was found to be in respiratory distress and required intubation and was brought in by ambulance to Jamaica Hospital. She has only had slight dry cough for a few hours while she was in flight. She also was having a low grade fever. She obviously had some difficulty breathing with dyspnea and shortness of breath. She has a history of diabetes and hypertension. She did not have any contact with anyone with known COVID. She is not a smoker. She retired as a school teacher. On examination, the vital signs revealed that her blood pressure was 110 over 70, her heart rate was 80, her respiratory rate was 18, her oxygen saturation was 98%, but she was already intubated and she was on 100% oxygen. Her temperature was 98.2. On examination, she responded to touch. She was intubated, connected to a mechanical ventilator. Her lungs revealed ronchi, breath sounds bilaterally. Heart was regular heart sounds with heart sound one and two. The abdomen was soft. There was normal bowel sounds. The extremities were warm and dry. The blood test, the complete blood count revealed a unique finding, which was decreased number of white blood cells, especially the lymphocytes. Now, like these are the cells that are responsible for the immune reaction. So as they are used up, the numbers get lower. So she had lymphopenia, she had mild anemia, but she also had increased platelet count from thrombocytosis. Because she had difficulty breathing, a CAT scan was obtained, which is a CT scan of the lung, which reveals the typical findings of COVID in the lung, which is ground glass opacities. Looks like literally like ground glass as I described it in both lungs. The blood bleeding parameters reveal that these coagulation tests were abnormal and the kidney function was abnormal too. This was a new finding. Supportive care was provided to her. Unfortunately, she did not recover and she died. Just to uh, go back to her case, like because she presented with fever, we also reviewed her peripheral smear and we did not see any malaria parasite. But as we discussed earlier, the symptoms, the pulmonary symptoms are more in keeping with COVID-19 infection. Let's look at the post-test. Question one, cough is one of the most common presenting symptoms of pediatric illnesses. This is false. Fever is actually one of the most common presenting symptoms of pediatric illness. Number two, Malaria caused by infection with plasmodium species parasites remains a major health burden globally. This is true. In, nine, in 2018, like I said earlier, 228 million malaria cases worldwide and more than 400,000 deaths were reported worldwide. Most of the cases were in Sub-Saharan Africa and the WHO Africa region accounts for more than 90% of the malaria cases globally and more than 90% of the malaria deaths globally. Question number three, malaria is not contagious and you can't catch it from physical contact with someone who has it. This is true. Malaria indeed is not contagious. The malaria parasite is not in an infected person's saliva and is not passed on from one person to another. This is one 
piece of information that is essential as we have heard anecdotal evidence that parents and family members are unwilling to care for or bring to healthcare settings their children who may have fevers as they're scared of catching it themselves. If it is malaria, it is not contagious. Number four, there's no vaccine that has demonstrated it can significantly reduce malaria and life-threatening severe malaria in young adult children. This is actually false. Late last year, RTSS was the first and to date the only vaccine that had demonstrated it can significantly reduce malaria and life-threatening severe malaria in young African children. The WHO-sponsored studies of phase four were ongoing in various parts of Africa. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has put a stop to most of these clinical studies. So we have a vaccine finally for malaria and the studies have been halted. We are still in search of a vaccine for COVID-19. This is the current situation. Question number five. In high burden settings, deaths due to malaria over five years could increase by up to 36% compared with if there was no COVID-19 pandemic. This is actually true. Modeling studies revealed that most infections, HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria are likely to increase and their deaths are likely to increase because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Whereas the other infections are likely to increase by 10% HIV death, TB by 20%, deaths due to malaria are projected in modeling to increase by 36%. We may bear this out to be actually true, or it might even be worse than this. Number six, anti-malaria medication can be prescribed to patients with fever without testing. This is actually false. It used to be if malaria is commonly present and there is an incidence of fever, you would empirically start them on an anti-malaria medication. However, due to the development of resistance and also improper use of anti-malaria medications, WHO in 2015 advocated the test and treat protocol which stipulates that anti-malaria medication should only be prescribed to patients following a parasitological confirmation of the malaria infection by microscopy. Like I said, you look at the blood smear under microscope or a rapid diagnostic test, RDT. Now, in the current pandemic scenario, perhaps it's time to reassess this test and treat protocol. However, the answer to this question is no. There's, without testing, you cannot prescribe anti-malaria medication. It is very important to invest in the fight against malaria and to support the fight against COVID-19. These save the lives of the most vulnerable, the pregnant women and children. These are my references, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Haran. It was very helpful, very informative. Please stay tuned with our next webinar. Thank you very much.